with this year marking a quarter century of EIE conferences. And particularly now we begin to close or conclude the 25th annual EIE conference. It is time to look forward. It's time to look to the future. What does the future bring us? And I'm pleased to be able to introduce our closing keynote speaker, Jack Uldrich, a futurologist and an author. Please, Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oops. I know the uh, most common question I typically get after my introduction is, well, what is it that a futurist does? Well, that's a great question, but rather than tell you what a futurist does, I want to show you what a futurist does. And I know that many of you have already seen this video, but I'm going to show it to you again anyways. So I told you I was going to show you what a futurist does. Look, I gave all of you an incentive to focus on a very specific task. And in your day-to-day -day jobs and responsibilities, you're similarly focused like a laser. As a futurist, however, I have the luxury of stepping back and looking at the big picture. And the first thing I like to remind my audiences is, is there's this 800-pound grill in the form of new emerging technologies that's walking front and center into our lives. It's beating its chest, saying, I'm going to transform virtually every aspect of higher education. But most of us don't see it because we're, our attention is focused elsewhere. But beyond that, certain job responsibilities and functions are going away. It's kind of like the person in the black shirt just walking away. Customer and student behavior is changing in some really subtle ways. And it's like the curtain changing colors, but we can't pick up on that because that's not where our attention is, a, is focused. But what I want to do in this presentation is help draw you back and see, help you see what you have been missing. And that, that we're going to have to adjust to this new world. And I know that uh, Sugata Mitra was here last year, but his School in the Cloud Initiative, which just won a million dollar award from uh, the TED conference, it points towards one possible vision. And if you remember from his talk last year, they are now educating children in the slums of New Delhi with no teachers present to a mathematic level equivalent of the eighth grade in both the United States and the UK. Now that's impressive, but think what we will be able to do, not just with the technology, but with the additional services of committed teachers and administrators such as yourself. Another area where I think we're going to have to do some unlearning is I know that a lot of people are still looking at MOOCs and going, well, did you know that only 10% of all people who take MOOCs graduate? 90% never finish. And that's a fair criticism, but I would still argue that 10% of 4.4 million is still 440,000 students who are now receiving a high quality education from Coursera and others. But here's the one thing that we can't do. As we, we often make this mistake of looking at new technologies, and we think we understand how they work, but we just don't get it. And by way of historical analogy, I'm going to show you this old uh, Spanish video clip. Look, if we don't understand a new technology, we might mistreat it. And I think that some of us, when we're looking at MOOCs, are just, we don't quite yet see the full potential. And here is a hint at the potential. How many of you are familiar with this uh, MOOC? It, uh, it's called Gener Generation Rwanda. It is now a MOOC in Rwanda. It's free. They're trying to provide a high quality university education to students in Rwanda. That they're open to the idea of unlearning. Another area where I think a lot of us are going to have to unlearn is I still meet a lot of people my age and older who go, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, it's all just a colossal waste of time. They should just merge into one super time wasting website called You Twit Face. I just don't get this stuff. <laughs> And if that's your impression of social media, I would submit to you that you're looking at this new technology from a flawed perspective. And by way of historical analogy again, uh, I'm going to go back about 30 years, and this is from a, uh, a UK-based uh, show, but let's see what happens here. This is an incredible power to market your institution, to reach out to alumni, to market to other students, to, to engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning that adds on to the already extraordinary education that you're already to delivering to these students. How many of you are familiar with this site? Duolingo. It's only a couple of years old. Already a half million students are accessing it to learn different languages. If you're not familiar with this, this is a peer-to-peer -peer based learning system and it is extraordinary. Scientific studies have uh, suggested that it's just as good as Rosetta Stone, not quite as good as uh, human instruction, but not bad. 
Now, let me just uh, quickly go back to one of my responsibilities as a futurist, and that's really to expand your mind. And I'm going to give away another, uh, a copy of another of my books, Higher on Learning to whoever can answer this question. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture a lake that you're familiar with, okay? And the lake can be any size, but let's say it's the first day of September. And on the first day of September, there is a single lily pad on this lake. The lily pad is of such a size that if it doubles every day in September, so on September 2, uh, there are two, the next day there would be four, the day after that there would be eight, then 16, 32, 64, keeps on doubling, and on September 30th, the entire lake is covered with the lily pads. Can everyone kind of picture that progression? Here's the question, though, and I'll give the book to whoever gets the answer within one percentage point. On day 20, two-thirds of the way through this doubling exercise, what percentage of the lake do you think would be covered? Just think an answer to yourself, but if you think you know the answer, raise your hand. Or if you want to wager a guess, shout it out. Any guesses? Uh, I tell you what, just in the interest of time, I, will, uh, I couldn't really see hands. A lot of people say, well, 10%, 25%. No, the answer is one-tenth of 1%. One and a lot of you are going, what? You've just spent the last 30 minutes telling me how fast exponential growth is growing, and you're telling me that the lily pads only cover one-tenth of one percent of this lake? Uh, yeah, in fact, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Because what else did I tell you? If something doubles just 10 more times, how much bigger is it? It's a 1,000 times bigger. So here's what happens under this little scenario. Day 25, it's still just a little over 3%. It's not till day 29 that we finally get over just over 50 and then, but boom, the next day the whole thing is covered. Why do I show you this? Well, I suspect a lot of you are saying, well, Mr. Future Man, if the world is changing as fast as you say it is, how come my world, my job, my institution feels pretty much the same? My message to you is these technologies have, in fact, been doubling. What you have to appreciate is we're just at day 20. The really big change is just ahead of us. That is the future we need to be preparing our students for, our society, ourselves, and our institutions for. Now, I know this is a little overwhelming, so I just want everyone to take a deep breath with me. And I want to remind you and prove to you that we have lived through this. How many of you are familiar? It's, it was an American movie that came out in 1988. It was called Wall Street. Any of you remember this movie? Some of you do. And in it, uh, Michael Douglas, the actor, plays a character named Gordon Gecko, And he's a high-powered Wall Street financier, a titan of capitalism. And to show that he is this high-powered titan 25 years ago, can any of you remember what device they showed him using back in 1988? It was that brick-like cell phone. And it was the Motorola Dynatech 8000X. And it cost the equivalent of 5,000 euros 25 years ago. So 25 years ago, that device did just belong to the elite. But let me show you another picture. This is from uh, a city in Africa. And today, those individuals don't just have cell phones, they have smartphones. They can access the internet, they can access agricultural markets, they could store every song they ever purchased if they're so motivated, they could produce their own movie. Some of them might have Siri, so they can ask questions to that device now. So it is a demonstrably more powerful tool at a fraction of the cost. And what has happened with just the last couple of years with smartphones? Like those lily pads, they have exploded out and they're transforming the world around us. What you have to appreciate is many of the technologies I'm telling you about today are at that Motorola Dynatech 8000 equivalent. They're fat, they're clunky, and they're expensive, and they don't seem as though they would affect or impact the world of higher education. But I'm here to tell you, the future is getting better, faster, and cheaper. And let me just give you one example. edX. It's a consortium of Harvard and MIT, arguably two of America's more elite academic institutions. And they're now offering all of their courses online for free. And so the immediate question becomes, well, how do you make money giving away all of your content for free? Well, here's how they are thinking about it. They are going to give away all of their content for free. But 
If a student takes their course and they want to receive accreditation, they're going to charge them about 100 euros. Suddenly, if they have a million students from all over the world taking their courses for accreditation, that's 100 million euros a year. That's how they're thinking about it. But I'm here to tell you the world is going to move even faster. There have been recent studies suggesting that online education is just marginally better than classroom education. And that may or may not be true for every course, but they're fairly com comparable today. What MIT and Harvard and other institutions in your parts of the world understand is the benefit of online courses. Every time a student stops, rewinds a video, or clicks on something, what are those institutions doing? They're learning about how that individual student learns. And their vision is not to offer one course to a million students. Their vision is to figure out how each and every one of you and your students learn differently and then deliver tailored courses to them. The idea that an elite, high quality education could be available to everybody, even the poorest of the poor, might sound ridiculous today, but from my perspective as a futurist, it is no more ridiculous than thinking 25 years ago, all of those people, 800 million people, would have the same thing that Gordon Gecko had. So, I like this quote from uh, the president of edX, and he has said, all of this technological change, this is the biggest change since the invention of the printing press. And I think the printing press is a wonderful um, analogy because here's what the beauty of the printing press was. All it did was it took existing technologies. It took paper, ink, movable type, and a wine press, converged them in a new way, in a way that revolutionized the world. I'm here to tell you today, with mobile technology, high-speed internet, faster computers, algorithms, we're going to converge to create new things. But just as what did it take the printing press to be really valuable? It took a human operator. And it took authors. And this is where your future lies. That this tool, these tools of the future, aren't going to put you out of work. They're, in fact, going to create greater demand for higher education. Your future is incredibly bright. And I want to go back to this picture from Generation Rwanda. This is a MOOC, but what do you notice? Learning always has been and always will be social. Learning will always be local. The benefit now is that all 7 billion people on this planet have the potential to be educated. That is a huge market for you. But it gets even huger because the imperative of the future is not that we just educate these students for two, three, or four years. We all have to engage in lifelong learning. There's a wonderful quote, and I'm going to go back to it. I know that my talk leaves a lot of people anxious about the future, but what's the best way to deal with all of the anxiety, to deal with all of this change? It has been said that the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. These tools, trends, technologies are all real. The opportunity for all of you is to embrace them, to create a better, brighter future. And if you do that, your future is going to be incredibly bright. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.